growth that we saw in the first lecture. And then we saw that, uh, bless you, uh, we saw that a consequence of this potential for exponential growth was that the, the emergence of competition uh, between species in nature. But we also found that some patterns that clear departure from what we should expect. Specifically, there are evidence of resources that are available in nature, what we should not be the case if comp competition was the driving force shaping diversity. Specifically, this is specific, especially true for herbivores that apparently are not able to take over the amount of resources that we observe in nature in the form of green leaves. And the answer for that question is that herbivores are controlled by their predators. Actually, they are natural enemies. So the word is green because there is uh, natural enemies that put the populations in check and do not allow those organisms to get high numbers and as a consequence take over the resources. Uh, the, the perception that the predators are uh, interesting elements of, uh, of nature is not new at all, and that's why most of the civilizations and empires use predators as symbols of powers. Actually, we used to be prey of some of them for a while, so this creates a mix of fascination, fear, and respect, isn't it? Like, and this is occurring all over the place, from the bald eagles in the US, to the hyenas mask in Africa, passing for jaguar costumes, uh, killer whales, monuments, and even lions with wings and coins. But the notion that predators are important, predators, parasites, and other natural en enemies are important to shape diversity is relatively new. Uh, for a while, we thought about them as like some beautiful ornaments of life. Things that are up in the community, they are beautiful, interesting, but they are not driving forces of the system. This changes based upon one experiment that was performed in 1960, and we'll talk later about that. Right now, I would like just to mention that this is the typical illustration, this, typ this type of interaction is a typical illustration of the mix uh, of the multiple origins of community ecology. Because depending on the, your background, you name the, this, this type of interaction, these types, types of interactions in different ways. For example, we call predation this interaction in which this lioness is, will have a fitness increase and the zebra is running for their lives. But this is another interaction that was very important for public health. It share the same basic aspect. It is a plus minus interaction. A positive effect on one organism, a negative effect on, an, on a different organism. In this particular case, in predation, you, the predator kills the prey. Here, the parasite does not necessarily kill. And, I, and here, I would like to remember that these uh, concepts are just metaphors. If you have a huge parasite load, you will die. OK? And to be honest, great, great part of the mortality in humanity, until, including today, but for ages, was driven by parasites. So parasites kill people, given enough time. And in, for sure, they reduce our life expectancy. So we don't need to be very uh, fanatic about the, those definitions, OK? They are just helping us out to move to the diversity in nature. 
for some of those interactions, we, we define them based upon the group that are interacting, uh, uh, the groups that are interacting, like herbivory, is involved with plants, and grazing, because the organism is feeding upon grass, okay? But this type of interaction is def definitely is not like a predator, a prey, because it doesn't necessarily kill, but also this organism will interact with multiple resources through its life. It's not like a parasite that we spend in a very complex life cycle in three different individuals through its entire life. Okay? It's just biting parts of, of the resource and move around, moving around. It's quite similar to what these organisms do, like they attack multiple prey, like the female of the mosquito take, take our blood to help to the development of the eggs but then move to another host and, do in, and fly to host to host without spending much time with any of them, but also without killing any of them. There's some music, this is good. Uh, <laughs> and finally, we have the, what people call the parasitoids. They're similar to parasites, but they necessarily kill the, the, the host through a very intimate interaction. It's not like a predator that goes there kill and feed, and then kill the next. A, paras a parasitoid will spend a lot of time with a single host, but at the end, they will necessarily kill the host. So an antagonism is an interaction between individuals of different species, leading to fitness reduction in terms of survival or fecundity of one, indivi of one individual and increase, fitness increase to the other individual. And guys, don't worry, if you want the, all the slides, it's just, I, I will make everything available uh, after, at the end of the week. So here, the question today is, what happens if antagonisms are the driving force? So it's not competition anymore, antagonisms are operating. So I will first we define what is a bottom-up and a top-down effect, then we will move to top-down control, that is the effect that leads to the control of competitors by uh, natural enemies. And this will lead to the coexistence mediated by these enemies. Then we go to different trophic levels and we explore a bit of trophic cascades. I will spend a bit of time with the structural stability of these networks that predator-prey interactions create on nature. Not only predator-prey interactions, but most of the interactions that we observe in food webs are, are involving predators and prey. And finally, then, and this is, it will be just like two slides, I will talk a bit, a bit about the interaction among antagonisms and dispersal, and how this may be very important to keep diversity, diversity through spatial-temporal variation. In, 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 in the species composition. I finish with a, summar, a summary, and then we have, we have some, um, I think it was three, three references to further reading for anyone more interested on this topic. So we see how natural enemies can contribute to a species coexistence to generate diversity. And this is not intuitive, okay? It's not complicated, but definitely is not intuitive. Then we go for trophic cascades and how they may shape not only the coexistence among competitors, but entire ecosystems. And finally, we will see uh, the different ways that food webs, the structure of the food webs, and this Miguel, next week, we spend a lot of time talking with you guys about that through the week. But this is a glimpse on the, on the network ecology. That's how the structure of those networks, those webs, may have consequences to the persistence of species uh, in nature. So let's start defining and exploring bottom-up and top-down effects. And here we are in the world of selection. We are talking about essentially about selection. We, we already talk about ecological drift. We talk a, a, about dispersal. 
and we mentioned speciation, but now we are focused on selection. And here, I, we, I, we will focus on changes in the relative abundance of species and on the composition of species in a given site. So the idea that the, the community that have more equitative distribution of abundances are more diverse, as we saw in the first lecture. Okay? And we assume that there is a competitive hierarchy. So we are focusing on the coexistence of potential competitors. And in this, in this hierarchy, this is a li linear hi hierarchy. The red beats the yellow, the yellow the beats the green, green outcompete blue, blue, purple, purple, black, and black and white. Okay? So white is the weak competitor. The red is the uh, stronger competitor. A very, no, don't, there is not necessarily to be a, a, lean, a line hierarchy, but we assume that because it's easier, okay? And so imagine that you have a community and the size uh, here is proportional to the abundance or the biomass of different species and everything is in the white uh, re rectangle are, uh, are, are existing there in the community, other species went extinct, and we have a, comp uh, 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 a community with low diversity. We have clearly a very dominant species here, just a few species there, and this is a low diversity si system. And then we introduce a predator. So what happens? The first answer is nothing happens. And this occurs in nature. So through this, this, this lecture, what we are trying to build up is a map, a theoretical map of potential consequences of the presence of natural enemies. So in some systems, we have predators and nothing happens. The predator is, is there or not there, does not change the diversity of the system in terms of changing the, the distribution of abundances and the number of species of potential competitors. And this occurs in several places. Like if you go to the uh, thermic, uh, oh, I don't know the English name for that. I'm sorry. So this term, thermo, anyone know, know the English name for that? Is the Ricardo. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. And uh, you guys listen to me? Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. So in this, in the thermal vents, uh, you have this gastropod species that is feeding upon different organisms that are living around the the, the vents, and the presence or the absence will not change. The, the distribution of abundances of that species. This is what we call a bottom-up community, a community that is organizing through bottom-up effects. Diversity is mediated by effects that go from the, the lower trophic levels to the upper trophic levels. It's simply a consequence, like the herbivores, for example, there, are defined in terms of abundances because the resources that, that, like the plants, or in this case, the, the mi microorganisms that are available uh, in the substrate, okay? And the predator is not changing anything. It's a boring scenario. And this, but this is the usual, be, usual benchmark for the effects of predator. I mean, we don't, we, and this is how classically we think of, you know, in ecological communities. We have the sun, energy comes, then we have a lot of plants, and then we have herbivores feeding on plants. Herbivores are determined by plants, and then predators are determined by the herbivores, the predators' numbers, and the species. 
by the air before us and so on. It's more interesting in the scenario that you have uh, the natural enemies regulating the prey. But the, this is a scenario that we call a top-down, where you have a top-down effect. A effect that comes from the top down to the, the, the bottom of the, uh, the food web. So if the, in this case, if the predator prey upon uh, the rare prey, so imagine that you have a predator, he's preying specifically on rare prey, and this will lead to a, 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 a reduction in the first. You, you, the situation was terrible for this weak competitor, and now they have a, a natural enemy, enemy controlling their numbers. So this will tend to reduce diversity. And we observe that. Thank you, Natalia. Sorry, guys. Uh, like in the, this is a famous group of lizards, the Anolis lizards from the Carib uh, Caribbean islands. And in this case, by some aspect of the natural history, they prey upon spiders that are particularly rare in the <laughs> environment. So they, the presence of the lizards reduce the diversity of spiders by knocking out species that are already rare. But the most interesting case is a situation in which the predator or the parasite controls the best competitor, the strong, stronger competitor. So if the predator prey primarily on the, on the strong competitor or the dominant species, they will reduce the abundance of the, of the stronger competitor this will generate a competition release, make some resources available, and other species will increase in number, and maybe some species will be able to colonize that place. And this is not intuitive, isn't it? So what I'm saying here is that from the, at the species level, the presence of a predator is good for the prey. That's definitely not intuitive, at least not for me, isn't it? So um, the presence of a natural enemy allows the individuals of this species that will be, they will be killed by this predator, if the predator has the opportunity, okay? But allows the, for this, this species to actually, the individuals of this species to actually uh, survive and persist in that environment. And now we're looking at the details of this top-down control and how this can mediate the coexistence among competitors. And to do so, I would like to tell you guys the, what I think is the most important experiment in community ecology. And we are not playing upon lions and lionesses here, but with another terrible predator, the starfish. Uh, who, who, who preys upon the sessile organisms in the rocky shores. And this is the work by Robert Payne. Robert Payne in the 60s come up with this idea that was if he removed the starfish, what happens? What happens? Until now, the predators will be determined by the prey, nothing, nothing interesting. But in what happens if actually the predator is shaping the diversity of prey? So he, he moves, he is a beautiful paper because there is a lot of information about natural history in different sites. And in one particular site, I think in California, they, he actually do the experimental manipulation. And, though, and these are the results. So here you have ears. Number of species present. Oh, those are sessile organisms living there. And the, the black line is the control. It's just some plot there with the starfish. And the diversity actually increases a bit through time. But after the removal of Pisaste, the starfish, the number of species 
collapse and keep low through time. So this demonstrates that by removing the natural enemy, you actually reduce the diversity of prey in this particular system. So this is uh, an example of top-down medi effect mediated by mediating species coexistence. And let's explain how this occurs. So here we have a group of sessile organisms living in the rock shores. And each of those organisms actually is supporting a food chain. Like there is their, they have their own specific uh, natural enemies that have uh, their own specific natural enemies and so on. So the colors actually describe uh, the food web that grows from, from using these different organisms as bases, as the bases, okay? And then we have the starfish. And this starfish is prey, prey primarily upon the best competitor, that, that species of mussel over there, in the, in, in, down there here. So the predator is keeping the, the competitor in check. We know that because of the result of the experiment. So when you remove the species, this species now is released from the predation, predator effect. And so they increase the abundance and we start to take over. At some point, you are still keeping the, sorry about that. We're still keeping the species there, but those species are not able to keep other species over there. They are just some ghosts there, you know, like just a few individuals. But given enough time, you actually end up with almost a single species site Without, with very low diversity. So this is the mechanism that explains what happens, why removing a predator may reduce the diversity of their own prey. And this is the idea of keystone species. Uh, so starfish was the first keystone species described. And here I have my children uh, explaining what is a keystone. Like, for, I don't know for people from the other places here, but in Portuguese, there is, a, is mistranslated the word. Like, we use the word species chave, like a key species. And that's okay, but this does not capture the notion of a keystone. A keystone is this particular stone here that is actually almost identical to any other, any other stone there. If you look to the system, you don't say, okay, this is particularly important. Like the starfishes are not particularly abundant. It's just another species there. But actually, if you remove that particular stone here, everything falls apart. It's quite different than key, yeah? than Xavi. It's completely different than being able to argue. So this is the keystone species. This is a species, and this is, is amazing. I, 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 can, I, I cannot put this, I, I'm completely fascinated by his, by his work and the other people that explored Trophic Cascades because it's highly unintuitive. First, the predator is controlling the prey, and not the opposite. Second, if I would bet my money in, in select ice species that should be the most important species in a community, I would, I would select a dominant species. A foundational species, as people say in ecology, is like a species that characterizes the community, the physiognomy. But then, then, then you have this predator that is not particularly abundant, and you remove them, and everything changes. And this is not a idiosyncrasy of hot shores of, uh, in the California or the North and Northern Pacific coast. Although I use later another example from this same region because they are very well studied. Oh, I will give, I'll give two examples. This is another example from the same region. This is the Big Sioux area in California. And here we have a kelp forest. 
We'll come back to cap force in a moment, but, but here I would like to illustrate with another experiment the, the, the role of natural enemies in putting check the best competitors. So there is different species of algae there, and they are uh, consumed by herbivores, like the ketone. And here is a ketone feed upon a kelp, believe me. And what people did was do the same experiment of removal, but now they're removing the herbivores. And the prediction was that you reduce diversity, as in starfish system. But in starfish system, muscles take over and then you assume that it is the best competitor. Of course, you can measure that and people have been doing decades of work on that. But at that point, you just assume that. But here you can come with an independent measure of what would be a, the best competitor. For an algae, like a kelp, I would say that uh, the best competitor would be the, 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 the individuals of a species that is able to use the resource in a very efficient way to produce more of them, or to increase in biomass, or to produce more offspring. So the best competitor is the one that is able to use and allocate the resource efficiently, more efficiently. So the prediction is, if you remove the herbivores, diversity will increase, but the net production the net productivity of the system should increase because now you just, you just end up with the best competitors that are able to use the resource in a very efficient way and increase in biomass. And that's exactly what happens. When you remove the herbivores of the kelp forests, then we increase the diversity, sorry, we reduce the diversity. You keep just a single, uh, kelp there and is the kelp that have the more efficient growth rates in terms of individuals and the production of offspring. So the natural enemies can promote coexistence by putting in check the best competitor. And this comes with, with three different flavors. First, uh, they attack the stronger competitor. And there is many reasons based upon natural history that this, this should be true. For example, usually if you are very efficient in using your resource to increase in biomass, you are not using energy to produce defenses. Because defenses usually are, are very costly. So usually the best competitors are not put their energy in creating defenses, so they are more vulnerable to natural enemies. Second, Maybe the, the predator or the parasite is not specifically targeting the best competitor. It's just a hammer hitting hard everybody in the system. So if you have this situation, the, res the resources, we, we have a resource release and, and, and then the diversity will be maintained. And finally, and, more, and probably the most important uh, mechanism is that the natural enemy is not targeting the best competitor, the stronger competitor, but is targeting the dominant species. And by targeting the dominant species, they decrease the dominance of this species, allowing other species to increase because you have resource release, uh, competition release and resource availability. And this occurs if you have a generalist consumer like Darwin, when described the cattle uh, feeding upon grass, he compared with a machine who was just cutting down everything with equal probability. This is not true, of course, but it's a good approximation. And a generalist, in a purely ecological point of view, I'm not talking about evolution here, in a poor, in a poor ecological point of view, a generalist is an individual that uses resources in the frequency they occur in nature. So they show no preference. Of course, it's very hard to, to, to define this particular word I use, in, how, uh, the frequency they encounter, in, in, in the frequency they observe in nature, they encounter in nature, because we don't know how organisms see the world. They are not seeing the world like us. 
but, but the idea is that. So, yeah? A, a question in the uh, previous slide. No. Oh. Two, yeah, my, more one. Yeah, like in this, in this trade mechanisms, I, I understand like the mechanism one and three can increase the biodiversity, but the two cannot, right? It will just maintain the one that already is. Because if you like act equally in all of those, you're just uh, uh, increasing the resources, but you're not increasing the, the weakest one, okay? Because it will remain the, the weakest. Right? Yeah, but, but you are not necessarily acting equal among them. You are just controlling everybody in the system. Okay. So this may allow some species to persist. Okay. But you are right. One of the problems, if the, the predator pressure is so strong and they are attacking everybody in the system, then you may end up with low diversity. Okay. Because you are, you are, you are in a terrible situation already <laughs> and then you have a predator like take over the... The individuals. It would be the case of invasions or things like this. It's definitely the case what we do, <laughs> and, 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 and probably for some invasive predators, like what rats do or snakes do, in some places. Like there is one fam famous case that a snake that increases in abundance in one island called Guan, and then uh, there is a lot of bird extinctions because the, 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 the snake is just taking down everything. Literally. Yeah? Outside of these experiments, um, how do you usually try to identify what situation you're in regarding whether this predator is a keystone species or if this predator is just, it's just there and it could go away? Yeah, well, uh, I will before I answer you, uh, I think that I, we need to, I need to point out that keystone species is just one particular case of species li uh, generating top-down effects. To be a, there is many definitions as always, but the classical definition of keystone species is a species that have an effect in the ecosystem that is larger than predicted by their abundances. So there is no, nothing special in terms, remember ecology, is the, the study of the distribution of abundances of species across the space and time. So you look there and there is nothing special in that particular species in terms of numbers, but it's a key element of the system, a keystone element of the system. Um, the, the strong evidence is experimental manipulation, but you can use, sometimes you don't do, do the experiment, but you use the a situation like the absence of predator by another reason, I will illustrate that in, in a moment, to get some insight. So we can use historical evidence to, to make the case. And if you know a, a lot about the natural history, I bet that you can, you can, you can guess what are the candidates. But the, the, as always in science, the, the, the strong uh, evidence that you can get is the experimental evidence, isn't it? It's the mani manipulative experiment is the strong evidence that you can get. So when you have a generalist consumer, it's feeding upon the most common prey. So it reduces the, nu the numbers of the most abundant species. This shift the, the, the species abundance distribution, it shifts the pattern of resource use. So it's keeping moving around across different, different prey without specializing any of them, just moving around each other, like in, in an endless dance, and this will maintain diversity. In some cases, we increase diversity because other species can use the resources available. Okay? This is a kind of a frequent dependent dynamics. It's a very important class of dynamics in biology. Many phenomena in biology are frequent dependent. It's not dependent of the, ab the absolute numbers, but the relative numbers. Like in evolution, we have many cases of that. But even the most, the most terrible generalist species, like this terrible animal here, uh, are completely generalists. This awful organism feeds upon almost every kind of plant, but if you go next to the, the, their, their holes, the nests, 
you see some plants growing. This is belladonna. This is a very toxic plant. You get one of these fruits, smash, put water, give water for all you, you are all dead. <laughs> yeah, I'm serious, it's highly toxic plant. So the plants are not there, just waiting to be consumed. They defend themselves usually with, with chemical weapons. Uh, and this leads to specialization. It's one of the mechanisms that favor the evolution of specialization. And most of the animals in nature are specialized animals. We usually we don't get that, at least I don't get that, because I, I am from a species that is highly generalist in resource use. But most of the organisms in nature are highly specialized. This is especially true for herbivores, like the pandas, the koalas, all these beautiful animals, and of course the lepidoptera and the larva, insect, insect larva. They are very specialized. If you go to Campinas and talk with my good friend André Freitas, Baku, and, and show a leaf of a plant and say, okay, this is, there is a caterpillar that was feeding on this leaf, and he will guess the, the genera of the butterfly with no margin for error in most of the cases. Yeah? Sorry, what was the causing factor you gave for the specialization? One of the, one of the effects is the chemical defenses that the, uh, the plants have. When you have organisms that are highly defen uh, show defenses, it's really difficult to feed upon those organisms and feed upon other organisms. Like if you have different two plants and they have different classes of chemical compounds, to have the detoxification machinery for each of those Compa compounds is very, is very costly. It's not the only case, okay? I'm just arguing in terms of plants and herbivores here. But this is also true for parasites. And parasitism is the most common lifestyle on Earth for animals. So parasites and herbivores, and most of these herbivores are like parasites. They spend all their life in a single host. Like grasshoppers are exceptions. Calls are exceptions. Most of the herbivores, they, they hatch in a single host, they feed on that, and then they become adults. And for parasites, uh, like, as I said, like a, a parasite with a very complicated lifestyle, we use three species, oh sorry, three individuals through their life. We say species and you get lost, isn't it? But actually are three different individuals of different species to its life. So it's a very specialized lifestyle. And you know, the moose population in some regions of the world was not controlled by wolves, it's not controlled by bears, it's controlled by parasites that, uh, that attack their, their um, intestines. And we know that, like we, we use parasitoids as a way of do biological controlling our crops, isn't it? Like we just throw them there and they kill the prey. The thing is that when you have a specialist herbivore, we do not have uh, the, the trick of changing what you are feeding upon depending on the numbers. Everything else being equal, a generalist predator is a much better candidate to promote coexistence in a community than a specialist. But sometimes the specialist is prey upon the best competitor, the dominant species, which makes sense because another, another factor that favors specialization is something to be very abundant. Specialization is favored if a resource is stable and project predictable through space and time. This is another way of getting a specialist species. So in some situations, a specialist will be specialized in the dominant species of the community. This will reduce the numbers of these species. You have resources, resource availability increases, competi competition release occurs, and the other species increase in numbers. This will lead to, uh, 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 to, to coexistence as well. But let's go back to the generalist 
generalist consumer, like this uh, grazer. We, in an experiment that was done in Africa using both cattle that was uh, um, handled by native people there and also the native ungulates, that is the, the wild ungulates on the same place, uh, people realized that, that the, the impact of the consumer, in this case the grazer, will vary with the densities of the grazer as well. So, if you have a low consumer density, you are in the competitive world that we saw yesterday. That is, antagonism is, is relevant in terms of shaping diversity here. What matters, we have the two best competitors surviving. If then the, the consumer density is large enough, then we have coexistence mediated by, by consumers, predators, grazers, parasites, and you have a high diversity. But if you increase too much the consumer density, diverse decays again, because you just end up with that, with that species. They are all very fast in reproduction. They just arrive at, produce offspring, and die, or they are well defended. They have the, the physical or chemical willpowering that allows them to fight back the consumers. Until now, I focus on a single law, uh, trophic level, the effects of the natural enemy to, to, to their prey. But these effects can cascade through the system, leading to trophic cascades. And this idea, the, the, in the study by Payne, we already have that, but this idea is best illustrated, in my humble opinion, by the work of my friend Jim Estes. Uh, Jim uh, studied, dedicated his life to study the kelp forests, as I mentioned before. And once I tricked him to actually draw what, everything he knows about the food web, he studied for decades, for 40, almost half century. So here, the, I framed that, is in my office in USP. So here we have, like, this is a weak effect, this is a medium effect, this is a strong evidence that we have an effect. He was just drawing that. I put here that information because when we talk about these results or we talk about models, sometimes we forget how difficult it is actually to get the empirical data to support and to generate those ideas. And The key element in this particular system is the fuffly, fuffly, the furry, but, but it's also like cute, cute maybe, <laughs> animal in the world is actually the, the mammal with the highest density of fur per square inch. So is that is in an accurate definition, is the most fuffly, fuffly, <laughs> furry, <laughs> Fofu in Portuguese, uh, organism in the world, okay? It's like a, a teddy bear. And this terrible predator is a generalist predator that prey upon sea urchins. And here is a sea urchin. And in this particular system, sea urchins are the terrible herbivores that we observe there because they, they consume the kelps. They consume the kelps, and as a consequence, the sea otters, by consuming the sea, the sea urchin, generates a positive effect on the kelps. This is what we call trophic cascade. So now, the predator is not mediating the coexistence of competitors. It's actually, in this particular case, mediating the existence, the very own existence of the producers of the system. So a trophic cascade is this alternate effects that goes down to uh, the, the food web. And here is one example that we get evidence without doing experiments, at least in the first moment. 
So the sea otters were, were, were killed almost to the extinction in Canada, in the US. There is just one small site here in California that was an island that, that some individuals survived. And, but they continue to exist in, in most of the Aleutian islands in between Russia and Alaska and down to Japan. And how the idea arrives was amazing. I mean, Jim Estes was there in Alaska measuring diversity because people will do like atomic tests there and see what happens with diversity because, I think, uh, because in this time, 70s, 60s is what people do. You just throw an atomic bomb in a place and say, okay, let's measure. <laughs> so he was like just recording the organisms. Turns out they, did, they gave up to throw the atomic bomb there. It was, it was good. And one day, Payne went there. Robert Payne went there. And Jim was doing like the PG th thesis. And he said, okay, I would like to see how the sea other numbers vary with the density of kelps. And then Payne turns to him and says, okay, this is cool, but it's trivial, isn't it? It would be very much more interesting if you find evidence that the sea orders are actually determining the kelp force and not the opposite. And so he makes the prediction, and some, at some point he get a, went to the boat to a Russian base about here and go there, and when he dive, he saw a completely empty space because there is no sea others there. It was a eureka moment. And then we have more data coming out because this population in California starts to expand. And as it was expanding through my lifetime, from the 70s until now, the, the kelp forces is recovering. And they are actually producing a force in front of our eyes. You can measure that and they measure everything tons of time. This is what looks like in this area when you don't have the sea otter. You have like a just uh, huge abundance of sea urchins and they take over the entire, the entire uh, kelp forest. And here was an experiment that Kirish, and I never know how to say her name, sorry about that, but what she did was to, mani to make experiments manipulating the density of sea urchins, just moving the density. And she shows that when you move the density of sea urchin, you move the system from a kelp forest to a barren seafloor. And this is not related with like the, the availability of, of resources for kelps. She also manipulated that. Until now, I talk about trophic effects, predators taking over, parasites cons consuming your tissues and things like that. But natural enemies also produce fear. I start the lecture talking about the fear that we have on them, isn't it? So the fear is also a very important ecological factor, although we do not have good estimates on that yet. But we do have experiments on that, and this is amazing. This is a very simple food web. We have some plant species here. We have data here for two species, two grasshoppers over there, and one predator, a spider. So I will, I will walk you guys through this, gra this plot. Both plots are quite similar, so I only use for one of the plants, okay? So let's start. So here we have just the plant growing without herbivores or spiders. And we are measuring here the biomass of this grass species. Then we add the grasshoppers. As expected, the biomass decays. It's expected, but not necessarily true, isn't it? Like you can have a herbivore take over some leaves, but you produce more leaves. So here we're actually showing a top-down effect of the herbivore on the, on the plant. I will jump this one. Here we add the spiders and, okay, the, the biomass increases because the spiders, the spiders are prey upon the grasshoppers, right? No, it's not right because the treatment I jumped is one that they put the spiders, but they glue the chelicera of the spiders. So the spiders cannot eat anything. 
It's terrible to do that with someone, isn't it? But they do that with the spider. So there is a spider there, it's moving, there is a spider, but cannot kill anything. It's impossible to kill. And look, the effect is the same. This is statistically equivalent, okay? And the same is true here. So the simple presence of the spider was enough to generate an effect on the biomass of the resource the prey uh, the spider's prey was consuming on. What he's doing is that the grasshopper is just jumping out of the plant. He's just running away. He's scared. He's, he has fear. It's a fear landscape, as you say. And this was, is one example of what we call non-trophic cascades. It's an effect imposed by a natural enemy that cascades through the system, but is not mediated by the consumption of organisms, direct, direct consumption. It's not m m changing the numbers. And some estimates indicate that up to 50% of all effects a predator has in a system can be, on average, on average assigned to uh, the, their presence and not their direct consumption of, of their prey. Because anybody that went once in the Atlantic forest or in any other natural habitat and tried to see a predation event is quite rare. I, wa I, I bird watch for, I don't know, 20 years. I saw a bird of prey take over a prey twice in my life. I saw ma many more ten uh, tentatives, try, sorry, ma many more tries, but only two successful. But one thing I know when I walk in any place here is that if the forest is in silence, silence, there is a bird of prey there, especially in the morning when the birds should be singing and everybody is in perfect silence. This is silence of fear. There is a bird prey there, and usually there is a bird, a bird of prey, a raptor there. But we know very few about that. Good, good opportunity for a career. <laughs> so let's move to a structure of uh, and stability of food webs. This is the last part of, the, of our uh, lecture. And here, uh, the notion that, that interactions connect species in a, in a community is definitely not new. Here is a, a, my fa one of my favorite uh, excerpts of uh, uh, Darwin's work. He, he, he's showing off, isn't it? Like he said, okay, I could give you another example of how animals and plants, most remote in the scale of nature, the scale of nature is that religious concept that the, the, the organisms, are, all species are organized in a scale by God. This is, this is a religious way of saying, are bound together by a web of complex re relations. We use that, that, that jargon today. We use web of complex interactions, complex networks. So that's not new. But since, uh, especially the end of last century, but on, on, on the 2000s, we have explosion of data and analysis of networks that increase with computers, with the internet, and, and with the complexity theory. I will not talk much about that. Miguel will talk about that. And today we have two speak speakers for Friday that will talk more about that as well. But here is the object that we would like to focus now. It's what we call a food web. In a food web, the nodes depict species, usually species, and the lines or edges depict, depict uh, interaction. So species, so we have the, here a lynx uh, chasing a, a hare. Uh, so we represent that, that as nodes the interactions as edges, and you forget everything else as a first approximation. And there are some structural patterns that you observe in food webs. The most fundamental one is that the food webs are structured in layers. 
We are never as beautiful as here. Perfect, perfect isolated layers, as you can see here, like the plants, the herbivores, the predator, and the super pred predator over there, the top predator. But even when you have like omni omnivorous species like us, you, you can assign a, a, a structure of layers in that communities. And in a food web, we have a f one fundamental aspect that I mentioned bef briefly before in this talk, that is a trophic chain. This, this, the distance in terms of edges that connect the top predator to the producer in, the, in your community. And you can measure, sorry, it's in Portuguese, uh, but I think everybody can follow me here. We can measure the number of trophic levels in food webs, and they are always low. So this is the second aspect of food webs, uh, structure of food webs. You have low number of these layers of these different uh, strata. So here we have the number of trophic levels. Here we have the frequency that you observe a food web with that number. That's the maximum length of a, f a food chain in that particular site, and you seldom get anything with more than six trophic levels. Here, an important note that parasites are always excluded, unfortunately, of this kind of, of analysis. But even if you think, let's forget parasites for a moment. You have a site with 300 species, 1,000 species, and you organize them in layers that goes up to six. It's a very uh, flattered structure. Uh, the control of the population of top predators is, is mostly a bottom up from the level of resources they get, or, or, or parasites are usually very important in that? We, we I'm not strongly familiarized by, with the literature, but what I can say that we have very few data, but we know some situations that parasites driven top predators to extinction. We have evidence for that. So I will not be surprised if the top predators are also under control of, by parasites, at least some level of control. But I cannot answer your question unequivocally at this point. The uh, uh, communities an analyzed in this article, uh, they, they are, they have like, you have. Okay. Uh, so the communities analyzed in, in this work, they are like mainly terrestrial or aquatical or something like that because th this uh, I we, we have a this mix changes mix between of these them. a mix yeah, of we, them yeah we have many many of the food webs especially a, uh, the old old studies are from uh, lakes okay aquatic but from, from lakes now we have a lot of marine food webs as well but also terrestrial food webs and all of them have this features that have a few low tro uh, number of trophic levels. Okay. Nice. Another interesting aspect of food webs is that food webs are organized in modules, groups of species that interact more with, with each other than with other species in the system. Like in, for this food web in a lake, you can see this group of species. So we have this structure, so food webs are networks that are organized in levels, just a few levels, and when you look to the interactions, they form groups. And those groups are connected by uh, top consumers, usually by top consumers. So in a purely energetic point of view, like in an ecosystem kind of view, energy flows from here. We have these different energy channels that in which energy is flowing to these different species, and they, they are linked by the predators. 
And less, the two last aspects about the structure of food webs that I would like to mention is that food webs are usually very sparse. We have a, a small number of interaction uh, uh, per species, and you can measure that in terms of what we call connectance. Connectance is the proportion of the links among species that you observe in this system in relationship to all links that could exist if all species, species interact with each, with each other. And one very interesting thing is that as the community gets richer and richer, the connectance decays. In such a way that usually you, have, you can have a species poor system that's very in connectance, you usually have high connectance, but species rich systems are always very sparse, very few interactions per species. And this, this lack of connectivity that we see among species, we also observe when two species interact. When two species interact, you have a few very strong links here depicted by the width of the edge. So this is a strong interaction, but most of the interactions that you observe in that system are weak, are very weak. Now we see how these structural patterns may contribute to the notion of stability. I will not go to the nasty mathematical details, I would like to motivate more the biological aspects here uh, in the sense that uh, the notion that diversity is associated with stability is old because people were traveling around the globe and finding the same biome, the same ecosystem across centuries, isn't it? Like you went to Mal Malaysia and, and you see a forest there and a hundred years later we went there and there is a forest there and then a hundred years later you travel again, again uh, there and there is a forest there. Or if you go to records of how Egypt civilization grows through time, you could see the environment was there, there is a change, it become dry and the ecosystem keep constant to the time. We have the records, we have the literature, we have the art, the local arts, the elegance that these ecosystems are there. So maybe species rich systems are stable, are persistent to time. And we know that the species poor systems are on the opposite, unstable, like things like that, where species grow and take over everything. Don't, 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 don't spend much time on this situation, isn't it? Like the, the river will change again, this will collapse, and, and, and everybody will die, it's terrible. Also, if you try to grow anything in a, an aquarium in your home, you see that is a, is a kind of uh, a mistake, isn't it? Like this, is, the most difficult thing is to keep like two or three species in an aquarium, especially for a saltwater aquarium, in your home. You change a little bit, one species eats everybody, or everybody dies, it's very unstable. And the same, and, and the same when you try to create in the lab two species like a predator or prey. So when you have a predator or prey, it's very difficult to keep both of them in the same, uh, in the same aquarium. You, you end up on the same cage, like we end up with this kind of dynamics, the prey increases in abundance, the predator increases, then the prey collapse, and then the predator die out. Sometimes the, the predator die out before the prey die out, and so the prey can persist, but it's very difficult to keep both of them. And to explore that, what people have been doing in ecology is used to the very same differential equations that we, worked, uh, we, we saw in the past lectures and you saw through the courses here, uh, but now to explore in a community level uh, way. So now we have a set of differential equations. This is based again the work by Logica and Volterra. Uh, and then we can explore the stability of food webs. And just to uh, a quick reminder what I mentioned about stability, when, it, when I, as a biologist, when I say stable persistence, I'm, I'm talking about some notion I have, but I need to make this more quantitative to explore through mathematical models. And to do so, uh, we can define some ideas. We can define what is, first, uh, bless you, 
uh, a steady state. A steady state is a state in which the system does not change anymore. And in this particular case, we are talking about the abundances of the species in the system. Okay? Because we, we are focused on the abundances. And then we make a perturbation. Perturbation here is a change in the abundances in this, at this steady state. We are just create a small variation. And this can generate two situations and, re and, and it can reveal to, for, uh, to us if the system is stable or unstable in this particular narrow mathematical sense. Uh, is unstable if you, I do this perturbation and the system does not return to the, to the steady state. And is it stable if once after I give this perturbation the system went back to this TD state, okay? The way people explore that in, in, with a set of differential equations is through the, what we call a Jacobian matrix. A Jacobian matrix will describe the changes uh, at the equilibrium after, in this particular case, after the linearization of the this, of this system of equations describing uh, the system at the fixed points. But in ecology, this will be very difficult to estimate. In the field, remember, I talk, my friend spent like half of century, century with his, his, his students exploring a, a single site, and he has some evidence, most of them experimental evidence, qualitative evidence related to experiments, like big changes. So what people did was actually to use tools that came from random matrix theory to explore the situation. So you do not have the interaction strengths, you do not know the effects, sometimes you don't know even the functional forms that describe how a parameter affect uh, the, of a prey affect the predator and vice versa. But you have the sign of the interaction, it's a positive or negative sign or new. Like here, for example, the ocelot preying upon a toucan will leave a negative effect. The tangara, uh, the, the tanager, sorry, with the tuca, we have no effect at all, and the tuca will feed upon the, the fruits of this, this, these trees, terculia, and this will have a positive effect. Tucas also prey upon the, the flashings of, of, of yacinti macaws, so have a negative effect on these macaws. So we can try to build that up. And the results are, and these results are very robust to many different assumptions that you can use to estimate if the steady state is uh, stable or unstable. So this result is quite general for at least the way people have been modeling food webs in literature. It's not related to, specifically to any particular model. That's my point is that when you have the, here the richness, here the connectance, you create two areas in the plots that here the networks are usually unstable when you build up these networks, and here they are stable. So we have these two different regions, and the empirical systems surprisingly follow this prediction. So although people have no way of parameterizing the tail of these models, Although these models are based upon very few information of empirical systems, the prediction that this, the, the networks would become more sparse if species rich because they will be unstable otherwise holds. And of course, there is no selection acting at the community level. At least we have no evidence for that. It's not that everybody is agreeing, in agreement here Okay, let's not interact too much with each other because this is, will be not good for the community. There is not, no such thing. But what happens is that if you increase the number of interactions here because you have a generalist species arriving, the system becomes unstable. A cascading effects will propagate in the, in the system, will um, amplify perturbations leading to species to die out and interactions to be lost and the system will move in that direction. Like you, if you try to build a sand pile and, and keep throwing grain, grains of sand, 
and the sand pile will increase, 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 and sometimes you have a cascade, isn't it? But the overall structure of the sand pile will be quite similar through time because once become, when deviate from this stable uh, structure, then you have a, a, a cascading effect that you move the system back to the stable region. And that is probably the mechanism operating here. Yo. Following what you said, so basically what you said about the generalistic species, so basically you can only have a high number of species in a site if you have a lot of specialist species. Yeah. That's the only possibility. Yeah, yeah, it's quite surprising. Like if you look to the food webs or even any kind of ecological network, tomorrow we see mutualistic networks, uh, no, networks of positive effects. It's okay, let's see a species that interact with a lot of elements in the system. It is usually a, a very small proportion of the diversity. We have just a few of them. As I mentioned, like this, so few links increases the stability, increases the likelihood to have a stable system, to be more accurate. Another way of increases the likelihood to have a, a stable system is to not have too much, too many strong interactions. The problem with strong interactions is when, if the prey increases, this gives a huge impact on the predator. And then the predator will have a huge impact on the prey, and so they will start to oscillate. And in natural world, when you oscillate too much, sometimes you hit the ground, and then, and then it's over. But if you look to food webs, and imagine that here you have the energy that you translate to demography, isn't it? Like the, to numbers of individuals. So energy is entering the system. This leads to increase in the populations of some species, but then, this effect is dissipated through mush links. There is many channels leading to, to, this, to the energy of, of that, that is related to this particular species that move not to a single node here, but to many nodes. So every predator here increases a little bit, and then every predator of the other predator just a tiny increase. Because you know, as energy moves up, a lot of them is dissipated. Life is not particularly efficient in, tra in, tra in, the, in transmission of energy from one trophic level to the next trophic level. Okay? So we have this dissipation effect that will remove the destabilizing effects of oscillations related to strong interactions. And now, Finally, the modules and how the large, uh, the top predators can contribute to stability in this case. When you have a module structure, you have a system that is dumped for extinctions, isn't it? Because imagine that this, uh, there is some disease attacking this plant. This may effect, have effect here. Maybe some predator will suffer. But these people here, they are protected because they are in their own clique. In, in our own group. Modularity enhance stability by, do, by, by not allowing cascading effects to move freely to the, to the food web. But then there is one important aspect, and just to finish, this is quite fast, but this is very, this is very important, especially for people that would like to, uh, is interested on conservation biology, for example. So, predators. Predators connecting modules. So this predator, predator is moving around the space. And, and let's be clear, there is, when you move up here, you change the scale, you observe nature. Usually organisms on the top here are operating in much broader scale, spatial scales. Like, like for Africa, what would be from seven to 12 different communities in terms of plants and herbivores is the, is the uh, territory of a single pride of lionesses. So I'm not talking about the species or the population, I'm talking about the group. So it's just moving around. So this 
lions and lionesses come here, they reduce the predators they compete with, they prey upon some prey, this generate direct effects that will lead to the collapse, the reduction of predators, an increase of other herbivores they don't feed upon, and also on the producers. So the prey starts to reduce, the predators start to starve, they move. And they move to, to the other side. Moving to the other side, they do the same in the other side, but now the first module can recover. And most of these modules have a, a habitat structure, as associated with habitats. And so we have this go back and forth, depending on where the predators are. They are just moving around. We can see these, for example, in the Atlantic Forest, not with vertebrates, but with army ants. Army ants, those ants that prey upon, that go, that create. Oh, type, if you don't know what is an army, army ant, please go to YouTube and type army ants later. It's worthwhile. And they destroy the diversity of insects locally, and then they move, because these ants do not have a, a physical nest. The nest is made up of ants. It's special. So the, all, the ants make the nest for the queen. And then they move to another, to another site and do the same, but then the diversity in this site of insects increases again. And so we are trapped in these spatial temporal dynamics of modules in which diversity is going back and forth but never, never collapsing. And if, it is, if it's a, this is a very important mechanism to maintain diversity, we have a problem. And the problem we have is that nature now is on cages. Like most of the diversity in the world now is under uh, fences or circumvented by habitats that we humans change. And the main effect of this kind of structure, uh, the, the first main effect of this kind of structure is reduce the habitat area, what would lead to reduction of the diversity, specifically of organisms that operate in large spatial scales. The second effect is dispersal is constrained. The organisms cannot move freely, and as a consequence, they will not recolonize sites after local extinctions. And what we miss right from the beginning the top consumers, the large uh, predators and what we call the megafauna, the large herbivores that again are biased perception used to think then as an oddity that you could observe in Africa and Asia, all oh, those elephants, that, the arenas there. But until 10,000 years ago, a glimpse of time, those are a dominant element of any food web in the world, any place the world has organisms like elephants. You know, here in South America was the highest diversity of them. On South, South Brazil, Uruguay, and North Argentina, we have like 11 species of mammals that were, that were eating more than one ton coexisting. We lost that. We lost that control. So this, this top-down control of top consumers that we saw many examples today, maybe they are already lost for most of the natural communities that we have the opportunity to observe uh, uh, currently. To finish, we focus today on antagonisms, uh, especially, specifically on prey coexistence, and also in build up food webs. As I said, food webs are composed by many different interactions, but the core of them are predator-prey interactions. And we saw that the antagonisms can promote prey coexistence in some situations, and, the food, and by generating a food web with particular structures, specifically the modules, few interactions in species resistance systems, weak links, and the connections among modules through top predators, this can promote uh, stability of the system. In addition, the, in the food webs, the very same mechanisms that promote prey coexistence uh, in, in a given trophic level, 
make cascades to the food web, and shape entire physiognomies, shape entire ecosystems, as the, in the case of the kelp forests. Okay, and the trophic cascades, the presence of top consumers will promote stability. I have some uh, three suggestions uh, for further reading. One of them is this, this study that was discussing the presence of these trophic cascades as a, a key uh, question in conservation biology. And specifically, the novel trophic cascades that are being generated through introduction, invasion, and reintroduction of organisms. Oh, uh, sorry, just two references today. And then this amazing book that uh, was written by, oh no, uh, by, by organized and led by the two leading scientists in food web theory, in food web science, Mercedes Pascual and Jennifer Dunn, and they put together in 2005 this amazing book on ecological networks, and food webs are the key elements. And, and to finish, I, uh, when I was in the undergrad studies, my supervisor invited me to go to the, to the library, that thing that, that the Egyptians use to keep knowledgement, isn't it? Like, like that we lost. And then this is these brown books, light brown books, called Annual Review in Ecology and Evolution. In that time, there is not, no systematics at that point. Or, or ecology and systematics, there is no evolution. I never remember that. And he said, pick one book and choose one, text, one, one paper to read. And I, asked, and I said to him, but if I don't like, if I found no, no interesting paper in this, in this book to read, those are reviews in ecology and evolution. And so he turns to me and said, if you are not able to find anything interesting in a single of these books, this is not for you. Find another thing to do it. You are losing our time here. And it was amazing because I get there and I start to read and I spend like semesters in my undergrad studies just picking these books and reading randomly. And then uh, on 19, 2019, Jim Estes invited me to write a piece on ecological networks. So this is not comparable to the, the book by Mercedes and Jennifer, Mercedes Pascual and Jennifer Dune, that is the, is the reference, but this is a biased, limited, and, but very honest view of what I think is the key topics in ecological networks, specifically on prey coexistence, but not only that. Okay, any questions? Yeah? When it comes to how these communities, um, well, I guess there are two questions. One is how they evolve, and the second is how they assemble. I guess those will be different situations. Yeah. But I guess the, uh, how, 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 when does the predator usually come in? If that is even a question that I, I, I'm always what? scared of, of asking these chicken egg questions in biology, but yeah. it's kind of. Um, you know, suppose there's an island being colonized or when, you know, life came out of the sea onto, onto land. Um, are the predators that first show up, are they usually omnivores that uh, are like, they are herbivores who are suddenly adapting themselves to eating their, their fellow herbivores or are they predators that adapt to the new um, environment, these kinds of okay. things? So cons consumers arrive after their, their, their future, future resources, but soon after, if you go, so this is the problem here is that I agree with you, there are two different questions. In a macroevolutionary point of view, predators arrive very, very at the beginning of the, of the game, and they emerge from the same groups and, but just soon after you have the, the one trophic level, you just get another one. And then from the first communities, like if you go to the Precambrian communities, you find a top predator. You're already, they are already there. Like life was, 
in silence in terms of multicellular life for billions of years, and then we, we, start, we have multicellular life, and then soon after we have everybody there. I mean, in terms of rows in a food web. Um, so they arrive pretty, pretty fast. In, when you talk about the assembly of ecological communities, they, oh, there is another important aspect in the macroevolutionary uh, sense. For more recent communities, like for mammals, we know that the lifespan of a species of top predator is quite small. So predators are being generated and dying out constantly, at least in terrestrial ecosystems. It's not, this might not be true in, in the oceans, but in the terrestrial ecosystems, this suggests an unstable lifestyle from the, the macroevolutionary point of view. You evolve hypercarnivory, you become the top predator, and then you die out, and then another group take over. Like we have different lineages of cyber, cyber tooth cats evolving independently through time, probably because of these, these dynamics. Locally, predators usually operate in very large uh, spatial scales. So before we arrive, those, the most dis uh, wide distributed species of mammals were predators. Like we have wolves almost every, every place in the old world from North Africa, entire Europe, Asia, goes down to the uh, uh, Southeast Asia. And we have lions that were, that, that were distributed in North America and North Peru, Peru, there we have lions, uh, into a glimpse of time, and then they die out. So predators are constantly moving, and they operate in scales that are much higher than the local community. So they just arrive. I, I would say that most of the cases, for most of the communities, the species in the ecological community, a predator is just a few individuals that are arriving there, using the area. You have that jaguar that uses 5,000 hectares, you know? That RP eagle that uses 25,000 hectares. 25,000 hectares. That is, it's huge, isn't it? But I, I would say that the, the, this is something that I would like to explore in, in ecological networks. And I think that this, this is one very important step that we miss it, is that everybody that we have been doing is under the assumption that these species are observing the world in the same scale, in the same spatial scale, I would argue. Like a, net, like a social network that everybody lives almost the same, have the same ability of, of, of interacting with people. I mean, it's not, it's not like ants and elephants, isn't it? Like they, they are operating in completely different scales. And this may, may be the key element that we miss that would allow us to understand these spatial temporal dynamics, including the, the arrival of the top predator in an ecological sense. I'm not sure if I answer you, but that's, that's, that's the way I wrap up my mind around your problem that is, is a Quite good question. Any additional question, guys? No? So tomorrow I see you guys to the last uh, talk of this week, uh, lecture of this week. Then we have talks on Friday, but the last uh, we ha we get lunch with some of you if you guys are interested, and then uh, we we have a change in gears here. We move to positive interactions. Let's stop to talk about natural enemies <laughs> and competitors and these nasty things.